folks. Uh, my name is George St. Clair, Pastor Church of the Messiah. We're going through the book of Revelation. Uh, we're going to do a bit of a different type of a devotional right now. I'm sort of going to try to capture a little bit uh, that I have not talked about directly uh, uh, from the six previous churches in the book of Revelation. Uh, and we're going to be next devotional looking at the seventh church, but I need to do something to sort of help to bring up a theme that's been there for several of them, uh, which I haven't really had a chance to develop. Uh, so one of the things which might strike you, well, actually what it is, is we're going to be looking really in a sense at one, we're going to look at about four verses, but if you just look at this one verse for the seventh church, it's Revelation chapter 3, verse 16. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 16. And it goes like this. Actually, we'll begin at verse 15. For I know your works, you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. <laughs> I will spit you out of my mouth. So one of the confusing things in these, uh, these different devotionals is that there's in fact this very, very stark language of judgment to the churches. Let's just have a quick look at them. If you flip back to Revelation chapter 2, verse 5b, that's the second half of verse 5, um, it says this, if not, in other words, if they haven't repented, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. In other words, you're going to cease to even be a visible church. That's the warning that Jesus gives. It's the first of all of the churches, so you have to think that it has a bit of an echo throughout all of the different seven churches, uh, this potential judgment that Jesus will close your doors. Uh, look at um, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 23. Uh, chapter 2, verse 23. This is for the church in Thyatira. And here it says, I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. And in this particular case, it's a message of judgment. Uh, that, in fact, once again, that if the church refuses to repent, there is the chance that Jesus will actually give you what you want, uh, which is a, a life apart from him, or give you, a, or close your door. Um, uh, there's one, one more, there's more, that, but one more. Look at uh, chapter 3, uh, the second part of uh, verse 1, uh, up to verse 3. It goes like this, I know your works, that you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. It's a very, very stark thing, eh? You have the reputation of being alive, but you are, in fact, dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. In other words, Jesus himself will actually come against the church. So, so here's the thing. How is it that these things go? It's a little bit confusing. On one level, you have these very powerful images. In every one of the seven uh, churches which is described, there's this sense that there's an angel connected to the church. It's telling us that, in a sense, the, the church has a, a spiritual heavenly realm which is beyond the sight of mortal eye. And at the same time, it talks about Jesus being amongst the lampstands. The lampstand is an image for the, the local church. And it has this image of how Jesus is. There's just always in every one of the seven churches, there's this picture of who Jesus is, uh, how to understand him and his person and his work in light of the local church. And that happens in all of them. Yet how can it be then that we have such stark warnings? Well, here's what I want to try to gather up over the next seven or eight minutes. And here's this. You have to make a distinction between the visible and the invisible church. It's a biblical distinction. Uh, it's easily lost, and some Christians sort of deny it. Uh, many Christians forget about it, but it's a very basic biblical distinction. Without this distinction between the visible and the invisible church, you won't understand either the promises or the warnings in Scripture to these seven churches. So first, the body of Christ, his true church, is invisible. The body of Christ, the true church, is invisible. So that, if you, if you think about it, when you become a Christian, when you put your faith and trust in Jesus and he receives you as his own, in some ways there's an image, which we'll look at maybe in a devotion soon, uh, that Jesus in a sense comes in and lives within you. 
But there's also this image of you entering into Jesus. And all of the New Testament teachings about his body is talking about, in a sense, the true church, which is all incorporated into Jesus. And this true church incorporated into Jesus, it transcends time. It includes Peter, it includes Augustine, it includes Calvin, it includes um, Corey Ten Boom, it includes me. And it also transcends space. It includes, right now, the faithful Christians in Kenya, in China, uh, and uh, me here in postmodern Ottawa, post-truth Ottawa. And so this church, it's visible to God, it's visible to Jesus knows who are his, and it's visible to the angels, but we, at the end of the day, don't know for sure who is a, who is a Christian, really has been born again. So that the true church is invisible. Here's the second thing. Jesus is the one who invented the local church. That doesn't mean he invented my local church or yours, uh, but it does mean that he invented the idea. He calls us to be part of a local church. You enter the Christian faith. You enter into salvation one at a time. Your parents can't make faith for you. You have to ultimately come to a faith in Jesus yourself. But while you enter the faith one by one, you never walk by yourself. Jesus says we walk with him in the company of others. And so Jesus has invented the local church. We can have some debates, and Christians do, about exactly how it's to be structured. But it is to have some type of structure with elders and pastors and teachers, amongst others. And we are called to be part of a local church. We walk with Jesus with others. Uh, you can be a Muslim, as I shared a, a couple of devotions ago, and never once go to a mosque, and, and you wouldn't be a bad Muslim if that was the case. You could be the best Muslim there is without ever once going to a mosque. You can't actually be a, a real follower of Jesus and not be part, like a real part, of a local church. Like a real part of a local church. And so, Jesus invented the idea and, in a sense, the calling of a local church. And that leads me to my third point, that every local church, the visible church, I mean, uh, once we stop being online, you could come to Church of the Messiah on a Sunday morning, and of course not everybody who calls Church of the Messiah their church home will be there on any given Sunday, but you could see us, and even now you can see our web presence and other types of things. There's Local churches are visible because human beings are visible and buildings are visible and worship services are visible. But every visible church is a mixed bag. There are, at least hopefully, uh, people in part of that visible church that in fact are part of the invisible church. But there are also recalcitrant sinners. There are people who might be part of a local church, have never given their life to Jesus, and in fact, the church is immunizing them against putting their faith and trust in Jesus. It's strengthening the rebellion against uh, God. And there, of course, are people who are on their way to becoming a Christian. They have not yet become Christians, but they're in the process of coming to a saving faith in Jesus. So every visible church is a mixed bag. And that's what we see here, by the way, in all of these seven churches is that they're mixed bags. It sounds as if maybe the church that we looked at in the last devotion, uh, just have to refresh my memory, the church at Philadelphia, it sounds as if there was maybe uh, the vast majority in that local church, so to speak, was also part of the invisible church. If you go to some of the other churches, it sounds as if it's questionable whether there's only one or two left in the entire visible church that are still part of the invisible church. And so these messages of judgment never come to the invisible church, but they come to the visible church, the local church. The great tragedy, as I shared a couple of devotionals ago, is this, that Jesus is still present, the angel is still present, and he is completely and other, that Jesus is completely and utterly ignored. In fact, if Jesus was to convict of sin or to bring his word to bear, it would create offense in that visible church, rather than sorrow because we've sinned or delight because of its promises. It would cause a scandal in visible churches to have Jesus speak very clearly and the Holy Spirit move very powerfully and it would cause a scandal. There is a visible church, Jesus is actually present, but his presence is either ignored 
were specifically rejected. And that's the danger. That's, if you don't understand that, you don't understand these different warnings and the different promises. It's referring to the problem of visible churches. And that leads us to my final very, very simple point. It shows us why every visible local church desperately, desperately, desperately needs reformation all the time, revival all the time, renewal all the time. The day I come to think, well, we at Church of the Messiah, we've arrived, you know, <laughs> you know, we're the true, tr the only true church, we've arrived. That's the day I st I, I'm doing this. I'm putting my ears, uh, my fingers in my ears so I don't listen to Jesus, and I'm closing my eyes so I don't see him. No, the fact of the matter is, is Lord, make us more the church you desire us to be. Make us a church that wants to know Jesus, to lift Jesus high, to trust him, to obey him, to follow him, to have him set the agenda, for him to stop the things that need to be stopped and start the things that need to start and continue the things that need to continue. Jesus, you alone are the health of our church. Please, Jesus, reform us by your word on a regular basis. Father, pour the Holy Spirit upon us to revive us by the Holy Spirit and renew us in what it is for us to, do, to, to live as a church and renew us in mission and making a difference for the world. Friends, please pray that for Church of the Messiah and pray it for whatever church you call home as well. And if you aren't part of a local church, a good local church, I encourage you that when this period of quarantine is over, that you seek out a church where the Bible is preached, the gospel is proclaimed, and Jesus is lifted high. Let's pray. Uh, Father, uh, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he died upon the cross. We thank you that he died upon the cross uh, because he wanted ordinary people like those like myself and those who are listening to this. He wanted ordinary people like us to be reconciled to you, to be saved, to be made right with you. And so, Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for who he is, for what he accomplished on the cross and what he taught. And we ask that the Holy Spirit would bring your word very deeply into our hearts so that we will trust in Jesus more and more and want more of Jesus and want him to be the true Savior and Lord of the Church of the Messiah and every local church. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.